Welcome to Finlos Asks. I'm happy to introduce you to Ufni. She and I met during Teacher Planning Week, our first year of teaching in 2005, and that connection is a large part of what helped me to get through that first year. And while she left the classroom for a time to earn her PhD and pursue her career as a poet, she was never far from students. She is presently a writing instructor at New College in Sarasota, Florida, and recently published a book of poetry called Little God through Burrow Press. In this interview, Avni discusses her evolving identity amidst the rapid changes of being a new mother, the relationship between parenting and teaching, and how our parents find their way into our lives, even if they are no longer with us. The sound of babies crying, like that noise makes me really happy because I associate it with like healthy babies. So it, mm. like, like baby noises in general are just good things. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a lot of noises. He's building his vocabulary. It's awesome. I've really been enjoying watching the, the videos that you're uploading. I, I'm like feeling, I'm of two minds about it. On one hand, I, I feel, you know, very protective of his identity and anonymity. And I'm like definitely uh not protecting that when i share his face and his his voice um and on the other hand i you know the digital space is one of the few places where you can where you know i think uh especially for like our version like elder millennials we've figured out how to like cultivate authentic connections with our communities, which are so disparate now. So part of me is like, well, how, how else am I going to like share him or like introduce my friends to him? And so, um, it's just being of two minds in that, in that pixelated non-space. For but, sure. Yeah. And you know, cause I get that, but how, how are you doing? How have you been? Uh, okay. I mean, it's, you know, it's a learning curve. Hey kiddo. Um, we're, you know, I'm 300% better than where I was on in the first month. So I feel like, you know, every month I'm learning more and getting better at it. Uh, the first month was much harder than, than I feel like it is now. Hi. Um, and a big part of it is like, he's communicating in his own ways. Like he's, yeah. <laughs> I love his like upset cries. Cause he's like, he's so opinionated. He's so fiery. Mm -hmm. Um, it's such a great expression of his personality. I'm into all of it. I know, baby. Hey, I'm listening. You want to be part of this podcast too? <laughs> I mean, you're an important part of it. It's true. He's, um, he's like kind of fussing and cussing. He's ridiculous. I don't know. I don't know like where he came from. Just this alien that's here to explode my life in the best possible way. Eva explained to me the mother and the the developing fetus, they actually exchange DNA. Yeah. And so like the idea that you will always have a piece of, of the baby with you and vice versa, that's so powerful. That is such a And that you're yeah, and like you're carrying your mother, right? Like you're there's uh something just inescapable about about that piece of knowledge. Like you're forever holding these ancestors. Yeah, and we've been talking because uh, Eva is doing a presentation with Encanto, like uh, talking about different types of trauma, especially intergenerational trauma. And it's hard because <laughs> as a parent, we're constantly trying to be better parents than our parents were for us. And yeah. We're, ch we're changing that DNA too, right? Like the the same trauma that we're kind of born with in our, in our DNA uh, adapts and changes over time. Um, so like the very nature of what we consider trauma is, is morphing and, and shape-shifting like in our bodies in real time. I know that, or I can, I can imagine that, um, trying to find the balance is, is always rough. Like it, it's, it's just fundamentally different from, for, for, for mothers, I think. And how are you, are you, are you, have you been able to, to sort of get into a balance you think where you feel comfortable? Like it's never going to be perfect. I don't think. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, the biggest question mark for me was like, what, what does this do to my identity? Like my sense, my, my understanding of myself. Um, and, you know, I think so often before we're parents, we realize like how limited our sense of our own capacities really 
is like we don't realize how um you know it wasn't like who am I it's like how have I how have I kind of underestimated my own identity and its capacity um so that that I think was a little challenging at first but I mean it's it's smoothed out and I think that's because we've had a lot of family help um we've had grandmas here every month for at least a week we've had um you know aunts and uncles showing up like sharing resources and hand-me-downs and so it's it's really been like I am okay because I have a a very like I am privileged to have a set of resources that I can lean on and that's been phenomenal but I think the transition out of this space is going to be more challenging like how do I go back to work where I used to be a different person um so we'll, we'll we'll kind of see how how all of that shapes up yeah so so this whole process has been very um like enlightening enlightening to say the least uh and uh, my mom always says like, you know, you're, you're ready when the baby arrives um, and like maybe not beforehand or, you know, you might think you know what motherhood or parenthood is, um, but it's the experience that really teaches you. So um, yeah, those are sort of the, the snippets that I'm, I'm holding on to and uh, just Parenthood is is so complicated and it's just as complicated as as the beings that you're raising. So that I, I try to carry that in mind whenever I'm confronted with like, you know, best practices or articles or, you know, conversations around parenting. I'm like less interested in what the literature has to say and more interested in in who my kid is. Um and yeah, he is way more interesting than all of that literature. So it's it's been kind of, yeah, enlightening to figure all that out. <laughs> yeah, the practical aspect of parenting is always just so much different than any anything that anything could prepare you for. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that that is you know, literature and advice can get you to a point and then the baby will teach you the rest. Your child will teach you the rest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that that's that's super cool to see. He's he's my favorite person, so just kind of wondering whether I'm his favorite person. Like, I just want to be his favorite person so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but I <laughs> imagine he's going to have a whole, like, pantheon of favorites, so. I struggled with that. Um, really? Yeah, for sure. And, and I think I think most do. Like, I, I think that there's there's an experience that I will never have. There was rejection and mm -hmm. and all you hear is I want mommy and it's like mm. I'm not good enough for you oh. <laughs> but it goes back and forth it, it's right you know as they they go through phases but I there is not a doubt in my mind that I mean the uh, like where we started the child is a part of you and vice versa mm -hmm. I don't think that there's anything that can ever change that um, yeah just on a biological fundamental level I think it's yeah there's something that you can provide and offer as an emotional and biological sustenance that nothing else can and that's awesome it is awesome it is awesome hey did you know you're a little awesome because i'm awesome that's right <laughs> this kid is like you're awesome because i'm awesome All right fair 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 <laughs>
how does alterity sort of make up who you are? And um, I was trying to think like some of the questions were around childhood and values and things like that. And I was like, what were my childhood hobbies, you know? Um, and my childhood hobby, like I, yeah, I liked reading and writing and I was an academic kid, but really, unfortunately, my hobbies really had to do with competency. I, I remember like in my twenties, somebody asking me like, no, but what do you do for fun? And I remember thinking like, I get good at things. Like I get good at the things you're supposed to be good at. And it's not, it wasn't like um, horseback riding or, you know, like, or exploring like interests in which I am a non-expert. It was really like honing expertise. Um, so getting good at competency. And that was like a really frustrating thing to realize as an older adult, like, wow, I just got good at being good. Ugh. And uh, <laughs> um, so like all of the type A Lisa Simpson pleasers out there are inwardly cringing because there's, you know, there's a real uh, burden maybe to that. And so um, when, with, within your question, like, how is this shifting my identities in ways? I mean, a, a big part of it is like, if control is your favorite is, is your favorite friend um, from a young age, then holding this little chaos being for which you have to exert control is this like really educational <laughs> uh, kind of kind of struggle. So I don't know. I find myself thinking back a lot to like, you know, when I find myself in the mornings, like really struggling to like get things going or feel like I'm in the groove or even just feeling resentful that I'm awake. I'm constantly thinking of all of this stuff from childhood where I like, I was just kind of grumpy and miserable for so much of it. And I'm like, well, I survived childhood. So now like, this is the easy part. And it wasn't like my childhood was especially, you know, uh, difficult. I, I had privileges and resources in ways that, you know, other people definitely didn't. So I guess I don't, I don't mean to like paint myself into a corner there, but uh, at the same time, I, I think I like my childhood was informed by so much like ha like self propelled tenacity like you just really have to be stubborn little shit like that I, I guess that's the only way that I can think of to describe myself as a child and as a young adult and as a middle aged adult um, so that tenacity feels pretty ingrained and it feels like something palpable that I can kind of go back to and. Um, so on one hand, I'm like clinging to this part of my identity as I'm moving forward. So I, I really, it really does feel like I am dragging my past into the present with me. Um, and that requires a lot of imagination, emotional energy and presence of mind. So I'm trying, I'm trying to hold it all and I, I hope I'm doing it, but it's, um, it's going to change every day. So I'm trying to be open to that too. And I'm, I'm hearing and, and reflecting on, on, the various stages of you that I that I've known and I wonder you know take parenting take partnering I've seen you teach and I know that the that quality that you have to to master it like I've seen that and 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 you know of all the the fellow educators that I know like you are a master teacher like that is something well, you know that too I mean we we've we've like we started the whole gamut together so like our and I think the the advantage of us getting to talk about teaching is that we were our, like, you were my first teacher friend. Um, and so I, I feel like we had a kind of behind the scenes access, not just to like what the performance looked like when we were in front of the classroom, but really the the difficult digestion and processing of everything that goes on, you know, when, when class is over. Um, and it, that, and you know that that mastery is not, bulletproof it's it's I think like and you probably experience this too like the more experienced you become in the classroom you're more porous to it and the the receptivity is um you, you're more attuned to the you're more receptive because you're more porous you're more porous because you trust the experience more you trust yourself more um and hopefully if we're lucky we get to trust our students more and that you know I I think when we started teaching when we were like 22 23 I could not imagine um, cultivating that kind of trust. Um, and I had no idea what that required, but now there's this real, real trust that the future, like whatever future we are building as educators, as parents, as partners, that trust is almost like you have to kind of just put your faith out there that like your receptiveness is going to pick up on something that's going to inform or protect or guide you. Um, and it's a, 
an organic intuitive evolution but you know 20 years ago we wouldn't have known that i'm so glad i'm so glad we didn't know that i'm so glad we know it now and it's it's bringing up two things one uh, just to to use a really overplayed metaphor but like the idea that all things whether it be professions or whatever like you you have the 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 beginning phases and then like this phase where you go into a chrysalis and you emerge as like this fully formed adult and it's not like that at all there are there are ebbs and flows and there are multiple revisions and multiple versions and not all of them are great like there's definitely phases where you're like I'm going to take a step back for a while because like I'm just tired and the other thing is a question because as I hear you discussing your innate need to 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 master things like how and is it fair to expect that you're always going to be able to do all of the things at the same time like a master teacher no. master parent master partner no. all together Oh God, I wish. Um, no, I feel like, uh, you know, for so much of youth, we've got this like forward momentum where we can like be leaning head first because we're diving towards some future. Right. And like now we're, you know, recalibrating in some way just to like not give ourselves whiplash. Um, because momentum changes as all as like all of these other factors arrive. Um, it's, always a negotiation. Like, what am I going to be good at today? Like I, I get to choose one thing um, or maybe two things if I'm lucky, but like, I am right. I'm not a good writer right now because I'm not writing. Uh, I'm not a great emailer <laughs> at the moment. Um, but this week I got to be because I had help and I didn't have to be the best parent. So um, grandma was here hanging out with the baby so I could, you know, get to be competent in other ways, but, but really like the balance doesn't happen through the individual. The balance happens through the community. Even when, you know, I am asked, okay, well, what do you need for you, for you today? Do you need, like, what are you going to do right now? Um, there are days where like comes home from work, he decompresses and he's with the baby and he's like, all right, what do you go, go do whatever you got to do. And I'm like, what do I, what, do, what else do I need to do? This is it. This is the only thing I need to do. Um, so he'll be like, go for a walk, go outside, go take a shower, whatever. And I'm like, but it, he's my best friend. I don't want to, I don't want to not hang out with my best friend. And, and uh, it's like, well, can he be my best friend for 10 minutes? I was like, no, cause then he'll forget me. And then I'll start to look like you and I can't handle that. So um, it's, <laughs> um, I, I don't think there is a balance. I think it's, I think it's more like a if it's not a balance, then you're like sort of like throwing out your arms for like to like catch yourself. Um, so maybe the balance comes from like finding more stable forces that you can uh, align your momentum with or against or something more stable than than your freneticism. And uh, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what those things are. And I think just to continue the comparison between teaching and parenting, but like we as teachers expect our, our students to bring a certain amount of energy to that equation as well. And when children are as young as, as yours is, it's that that balance is, is obviously much more dependent upon you to to put the energy into it. But there's going to be that day where you realize that that independent human is now developing a personality and interests and curiosities. And it's going to take that first step away from like 100 percent dependence. And it's a it's a it's a strange, like cathartic moment. No, I mean, I think, I think it echoes an earlier point that we were talking about, like our kids show us who they are. And uh, I don't, I don't know for sure exactly who this little one is going to be, but I, I get flashes and I see, I see parts of his dad. I see parts of my dad. I see like both of our families arriving. Um, when he sleeps, he like sort of puts his hand over his face when he's napping. Um, and, you know, that's a common enough like position. But then last week, his grandmother was like, oh my God, that's his grandfather. And of course, like his grandfather passed on to the other side. Um, so, you know, even just these flashes of like other people showing up is really cool. And, and he's young enough where we're, where us projecting those ideas is safe enough. But I, I know that at some point he is going to be driving the machine and uh, he'll be playing this very active role in like, exerting his autonomy and I'm I'm so stoked for him I'm stoked for us I yeah so I think like what parenthood has really taught me is like you get to become all of these new people and you don't even know who they are yet 
um, and you suddenly have this new guide that you know you thought you were totally in charge of, but really, like they're going to show you so much that you didn't even know was out there. So that's exciting. That's really exciting. For me personally, I know that becoming a parent really, I, I've come to consider the aspects of my parents that I've sort of inherited that are mm -hmm. beyond my control, but then behaviors that are obviously learned that I'm trying to change. Yeah. And, and parenting has a, has a way of doing that, but I think that it's just really just the excuse and kind of forces us because we see those things coming out and we don't want to do them anymore. I kind of feel like it's more, more age than it is parenting. I think like, maybe I you're right. Like yeah. What do you think you got from your parents in terms of your personality and who you are, mm -hmm. not just as a parent, but just as a person? Um, my family will always say that I'm a lot like my dad temperamentally. And I found that, you know, on one hand encouraging, but on another hand, very confusing because it felt like rejection. Oh, you're like your father. And my dad was always very, um, and then like, you know, my dad's a great guy or was a great guy. Uh, but he was always really reserved and difficult to read. So you're being told like, oh, you're written like this book in a different language that you don't know. Um, so they're, you know, the process of decoding what that could even be or imply, like, I couldn't ask my dad, how am I like you? Because he would, he would refuse. He would absolutely refuse that question. Because I I remember asking both of my parents, like, when you, when you see me, when you see my brother, um, do you see parts of yourself? And like, how do we carry you? That was my question for them. And my dad adamantly did not want any part of it. He was just like, I don't buy into this, this idea that you carry, you know, you carry parts of me for him, for him. Um, and this again is very much reflected in my own expression of identity. He's like, you are autonomous. You are not me. You are very much your own force, your own person. So it's not fair to say that like, I care, you carry these parts of me. And I'm like, Oh, that's exactly like something I would say. I'm so clearly you like, um, it's so obvious. Right. So, and uh, my mom's side of the family will see my brother and really overly identify these traits and qualities of my mom that he carries. But like, I always found that interesting because there's that, you know, kind of negation, like, well, don't worry about, don't worry about me. Like her brother's doing all of the difficult work. She's like her dad. And like, that was almost a kind of dismissive brush off. Uh, but, you know, family members have said like, I am, I resemble parts of my dad's side of the family, which is um, a lot of women on that side go into teaching, um, you know, literary, artistic or whatever, uh, that was very much an expression of like the Vias side of the family. And then my mom's side, um, like when I would ask my mom, how am I like you? Um, you know, she would, I think she would always say like, you're a people person. And I, found that to be a pretty vague I think she just didn't want me to feel bad she's like yeah sure you're a people person but really like in her mind she was probably like mm, I gotta say something uh so I guess I crave I crave people I crave community and connection and and that to me feels like an extension of my mom um so that's that's my answer I am and am not them I am very much them that is the answer that they would give so like later in life my dad did have this moment where he realized that even as a high schooler, I had, and then as younger, but like he remembers distinctly in high school, I was, I was trying to show them who I was um, by virtue of my interests or accomplishments or just engagement with things in life. And they weren't really picking up on it. I mean, they had their own stuff going on, but they really like didn't know. They really worried because they were like, well, you don't make sense to us. So we don't really know where you're going with this whole, whole, whoever you think you are. Um, and then years later, my dad said, like, you know, I really underestimated you. I, I didn't think that um, you knew where you were headed and you knew yourself all along. And I was like, I know, I've been trying to tell you. And uh, it was this moment where I, I don't know, he must have picked up how desperately I needed to be right about something. So he, he gave me that moment um, and I really needed it. Uh, but in high school, I was, you know, obsessed with languages. I was taking extra English classes as electives. And like, you know, I'd be enrolled in like AP English, but I wanted to take general English because they were reading books that we weren't reading in AP. And my dad, you know, was just like, no, we've got to totally rearrange your schedule. We got to sign up, you sign you up for computer science and physics. And like, 
you're going to be at a loss if you don't know how any, what any of these things are. And I, you know, was trying to say like, no, 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 I know where I'm going with this. Trust me. Um, but he was like, no, I don't trust you. You're 18. You don't know anything. And I'm like, I'm 18. I don't know anything, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I think that that is true for maybe us and so many of our students too. Like, So I associate like colors with you. Um, you're a very visual person, a very artistic person. And I'm, I'm just curious. This is just something that just popped into my mind. I'm, I'm imagining how we blend colors to create new colors. And so I think maybe... Maybe the idea that we that we get these these discrete aspects from our from our parents is not the way to think about it. But instead, like one parent is a particular shade, the other parent is another particular shade, and then they overlap creates this third shade, which is you. Like mm -hmm. so, what is what is that blending for you? What not in, in, a, in a literal color, but like how do how do you think that those the, the what the parents contributed to who you are? What is what is the amalgam of that? Do you think so? Like, what is the distinction of of who I am? Yeah. So, how am I distinct as a result of the colors or shades that inform me? Mm -hmm. If I'm understanding that right, um, I think uh, taking, you know, the gifts of my parents. I I was. <laughs> trying to think of this in terms of uh of poetry like what does what does poetry afford in, in so many different ways uh and we talk a lot in um the poetry world or in, in the writerly world you're probably familiar with this not of our uh influences but our um family tree of reading so like if we think of our biological family tree um, and you know what we've inherited and who we are as a result, there's also in poetry that a uh, kind of corollary. So like who are the, the writers and poets or artists that have informed your particular inflection of what you do? And so I guess if I were to like put, pull it all together and I gave a presentation about this um, earlier in the week and I was reflecting back on it like, oh, I didn't get to say this or I forgot to mention that, um, mischief is is really how I distinguish myself with and from the gifts I've been given and inherited. I think mischief offers subversion, but it also offers pleasure. And those are two components of my life that I really did not identify or exercise as a younger person that I really wish to exert moving forward. So, I was talking about erasure poetry in this panel, and uh, I had pulled this quote from um, Mary Rufel, who is also a, a poet. Um, and as she was describing her erasure process, she talks about like when she does erasure, she's not reading the page. She's sort of like letting the words hover above the page. And then she says, I find a word that I think is really delicious. And I start there. Um, so she's, she's going by intuition and sense and pleasure and letting that kind of inform the way that the poem arrives on the page. Um, and I think the other uh, part of erasure poetry is that because you're manipulating someone else's language, it's there's a graffiti type element to it. You wanna kind of mess with things, you wanna push back. Um, so play and subversion um, really undergird like what this mischief is. And this mischief isn't, to just make people's life difficult. It's like mischief for good. Um, you are so funny. You are talking to everybody and their mother right now. I think he's got some answers for you, but he just doesn't know what they are yet. Uh, I think I think he knows. He's, 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 he knows. He Maybe knows. I don't know, right? I'm one. Um, I, that, it's an interesting thought. Like I wonder how much... I don't think that the idea that we're blank slates when we're born, I don't think that that's accurate. I think that there's something there when we're born, right? We've already been learning for nine months or however long. Yeah. You know, so it's not that it's, you actually have to kind of unlearn that and then relearn how to communicate as a human being, right? And right. something that I, that I talk about, um, the act of being born is probably one of the greatest traumas we all experience in our entire lives because you are mm -hmm. removed from the, the, the purest sense of safety into this mm -hmm. giant world that is too much. It is con we are constantly over inundated with stimulus. And 
Mm -hmm. Our whole lives is spent just trying to learn to deal with that. Yeah. And I think whatever we think of our parents, even even when we disagree with our parents, even when we 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 ex we express bitterness or experience bitterness or resentment towards our parents, even those are are are, are safe spaces because it's like a sounding mm -hmm. board or it's a reminder of what I don't want to be. Or mm -hmm. there, or in the positive, this is that model was so good for me. I I really mm -hmm. want to take that aspect of who I was, of who they were, and implement it in some way. And it's impermanent, and and that's hard. And, yeah. And then it becomes this continuum because if you if and when you lose a parent, that reality shifts to you, and then you realize at some point, if things go right, if things go naturally, that my child is then going to experience that loss in the future, and and that's crazy. Um, and so it was really important for me um, and for Eva as well to make sure that the idea of impermanence is something that is always not taboo. My, I, I never knew in either of my grandfathers and both of my grandmothers died before uh, we had kids. Um, they knew Eva's grandmother, but not her mother. So then they know my father. So their their access to older generations is extremely limited. And so I think that that's, that's going to be a process for them that is going to be a little bit more acute because I think that one of the gifts of intergenerational families is, you know, to lose a grandparent, I think, is a little bit safer for a child than to lose a parent. And I don't know if that makes sense, but I think that we're sort of gifted these levels of mourning and so like you you have these stages of mourning the death of a grandparent is 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 a painful traumatic experience but it's still not your parent so yes we try to be as open with that as we can and it's it also helps me <laughs> yeah because i was not granted those conversations as a child yeah. because i think too many adults and not my parents necessarily but i think too many adults are misguided and thinking that kids can't have those conversations mm -hmm. yeah uh and we we even see that like our notion of childhood is um it's a very like fabricated space that you know sort of holds and exhibits like middle class uh western values um and in the ways that we are practicing it now so like so you know childhood in other cultures doesn't last as long as it does here or um, childhood isn't as uh, protected in other places as as we tend to do that and there's almost like we see our culture kind of responding to the harshness of the world by wanting to protect our young and so um, these conversations about loss and grief kind of open the door and allow some of that darkness to thrive and to kind of become normalized um, which I think is a, I think is a good thing, but uh, yeah, similar to you, like, I think one of the, the big differences, you know, from 20 years ago and now is that the language we had access to around discussing these things has really exploded, particularly in the last 10 years. So I think our, our own discomfort around difficulty or around loss or grief uh, feels better supported by the resources that we are able to share more communally now, um, surprisingly through like digital resources and spaces. Um, yeah, similarly, I think like my parents didn't really know how to have hard conversations with us. And it was generally, I mean, like, well, when I think about like difficult conversations, like asking my dad whether hell existed and he just sort of like looked at me and was like, no. And he, you know, he didn't go into it, but he was just like, no, that's not, a thing you need to worry about was sort of his his uh, response um, because he really didn't you know want me thinking that like if I set the table the wrong way then I was gonna have to worry about this underworld that was gonna yeah. open up beneath my feet and swallow me whole right um, life is as scary enough as it is in these you know like the the ways in which um, we'll scare ourselves is often something you know one of the cruelest things that we do to ourselves. Uh, so my my dad didn't really have the the language or the perspective to like unpack that. But uh, one of the gifts that I got from him was that he really didn't he didn't he wasn't versed in in like baby talk and he wasn't versed in um in softening things for children. So 
any conversation we had was sort of at on the level. Um, and I, I appreciate that now. Uh, so I, I appreciate like not being coddled in, in some ways and in many ways, like if he didn't have the, the tools to discuss something, he just wouldn't. Um, but if he wanted to impart some sort of like abstracted knowledge, he would, he would just sort of say it in his own language, which was like this highbrow, well-educated, um, language. And, uh, yeah, you either keep up or you just sort of hold on to it and try to like make your own sense of it when you're alone. But, you know, maybe that's, that's kind of a gift too. Like, you know, childhood doesn't have to feel as, as precious as it sometimes appears to be. How did you come back to, um, and I know that you never, you never stopped writing, but when, when we met, it was 2005, we were both mm-hmm. starting our first year of teaching. I knew that you, you, we know we talked about writing and stuff like that, but it seemed as if you're at the, at that time, your, your focus was primarily on, on the teaching aspect of your, of your, of your identity. How did poetry come back to sort of like occupy more of a central space there do you think um i after leaving gainesville which was really where my creative community had been for for so many years um and moving back to tallahassee to start teaching um you know it made sense that art was going to be the thing that kind of offered solace from the rest of like the working world so those first couple of years of teaching were so stressful and they were so uh, emotionally demanding that, uh, you know, I really felt like my energy can't live entirely in this one arena and um, it's not, it's not good for me. So, you know, everybody would say like, you've got to find your outlet or whatever. And um, that first year we had like, we were working all the time. Then we had like those professional is like professional professionalization courses on top of everything else. Um, <laughs> it just felt like torture. Um, so to answer your question, I decided to reach out to some old friends in town and just kind of say like, hey, let's start like a weekly writing club or meeting or like, let's just meet once a week to talk about writing related stuff. And I, so I remember trying to do that for a little bit and that kind of being marginally like, I, what I was trying to do was build community for myself. Like I want people that I can talk about writing with. Um, the following year, I tried to extend that a little further and was thinking like, okay, if I, I got to keep writing somehow, some way, and I was always like journaling, but um, I, I think I didn't really have like, it took a while for me to discover that what I really wanted and what I was trying to form um, was like a sort of informal writing club, but uh you know, everybody wanted something else, something different, slightly different. And uh, what I really wanted was instruction. I wanted to be taught how to write better. I I remember like my second year teaching my lunch break and everything. I was, um, you know, reading the poem a day websites every day. I was, you know, basically trying to learn from um, journals and from any online sources I could find, like what, what are these poems doing that I don't know or that I like don't know how to know? And I just kept kind of being confronted by this big gap in my own understanding of how writing happens. So my second year of teaching, I sort of just decided like, all right, I'm going to apply to programs and I'm going to see what happens. I'm going to like reach out to old professors for letters of rec or just help or whatever, because A, I ha- which was, which was weird. Like teaching is a full-time job, but then I also like had this incredible dearth in my personal life where I was like, you know, writing is more important to me than, than like a degree. It's a way of being in the world. And so there are these, you know, big holes in my way of being in the world. And I wonder if pursuing writing will help me understand what those gaps are and, you know, yes and no, but, uh, I decided that I would, um, put together a portfolio and I just started reading blogs and like reading as much as I could online about how to apply to these programs and like figuring out what do these programs offer that I can't get for myself. And, you know, it's mentorship and working with 
people who've been doing this for a long time. And also like, you know, it sounds so silly to say, but like my life felt so lonely that I would rather apply for graduate programs than actually engage those gaps in my life. So um, by the time I did get into grad school, it, you know, it was so all encompassing and I was very grateful for that. I was really grateful that I could pour, you know, I could fill all of these spaces in my life with writing or writing related community. And that made a huge difference for me. So not just reading, but the people um, and the conversations and uh, the changes that that informed or allowed. And then also just a space to be heard, a space where not just I was sharing my stuff, but I was getting like actual feedback on what was working and what wasn't, you know, and people just casually recommending like, oh, have you checked out this poet? Or like, oh, you might enjoy blah, blah, blah. And then finding a hundred different rabbit holes to squirrel down, you know, at the end of a week. So that's kind of how it all came together. But it was, it was kind of because the classroom is a lonely place. And like teaching can be a very lonely life. Do you think poetry, particularly as your as your main form? I know you you, you write everything. You you write essays. You write short stories. You write poetry. Do you think poetry is your your primary uh, mode of writing, though? Yeah, I think. I mean, it to to use sort of a a stunted metaphor. I don't know. It's not the best metaphor, but like I think about sentences as as like the threads that we're working with. Uh, so poetry allows these like small ornate swaths of fabric, um, short stories tend to be a little bigger, um, novels can be these like quilts that we like wrap ourselves up in, but, um, poems themselves can be these like embroidered expressions. Um, and I think like, for me that that's, that's the joy is, is like seeing the fabric come together. Mm -hmm. So, um, you're, you know, when you're working with like longer and larger forms, that's not to say that the lyricism is secondary. I, you know, we've, so many of us have like read, read the novels where we're just, I, I remember like reading The Shipping News by Annie Pr Pruel and um, her, the lyricism of her line or, you know, even Milan Kundera's uh, Unbearable Lightness of Being, just these, these standalone stand, like paragraphs or lines or interior thoughts that I, I thought, wow, that, that could be a poem or, oh, wow, that sentiment is a poem. And it just takes this different shape when um, a poet approaches that same idea. Uh, so I know the lyricism is there, but it's, it serves a different function when you're talking about these like larger forms. But um, with poems, I think, you know, you're really putting language under a magnifying glass and um, you're really engaging. The way that I like to think about it is you're engaging like the, the static between the fur of words. So <laughs> you've got you've got these verbs, you've got these nouns and they, they've got their own electricity and you put them next to each other and they create this like beautiful friction. And so getting to work with poems is to really engage just with that electricity more directly. That's how I feel about it. Is poetry like, do you, do you think that poetry best, like as far as creative stuff, because you, you're a visual artist, you draw, you paint, you do all of it. Is poetry, do you think, captures you the best? It's the thing that um, require, I don't know. I think it is the most direct line to, to cut through my bullshit. And it, you know, like cut through the nonsense I didn't think that I had or, or thought that I could like parse uh, without other people knowing or or responding or reacting to but um i subscribe to a poetry newsletter and uh the guy who writes the newsletter is just you know he's got like this photographic memory for for poems um he puts poems in conversations with one another and then once a week he'll talk about issues of craft and this week the issue was i i forget how he phrased it, but really it was like the, the tricks that, that established poets will use to avoid direct confrontation with something. So sometimes it'll be like a poet will raise a rhetorical question because they think it's like lyrical or profound, but really what it's doing is putting an, uh, an unfair amount of work on the reader to, you know, parse this, this question in relation to the poem or, you know, reflect on it for themselves where, that should be the poet's job. That should be the job of the speaker in the poem. Or 
you know, the thing that I really like kind of reacted to, I felt really called out was um, using like a very glib or breezy narrative, not narrative, but lyric voice. And it's sort of your way of like fancy footing out of doing the real thinking. So knowing that kind of the exacting scope of what poems can be and what good poems do um, is revealing this this surprise, insight, pleasure, or discomfort is when done well, it's, it's a really successful act of vulnerability. And poetry has taught me a kind of resilience in the face of the world, right? Like you can always give up on your art. You can always give up on this, this thing that you do as a hobby or for pleasure, because it isn't as relevant. It's easy to like put it on the shelf and say like, I'll come back to it sometime, whenever. And poems you can you can do that with poems but i think the the accountability that they can offer is is the thing that has taught me so much over the years and and the thing that like i want to continue exploring the world with whereas like other forms of art or exploration are are enjoyable on their own terms i love crochet because it i i tell people it keeps me off the streets like it keeps my hands busy i can feel anxious or vengeful and still produce the same pattern again and again. And it allows a space for my body to engage with material in this way. Gardening has a similar kind of effect or result. If, if poetry is the thing that's going to like inform who I am in the world and how I, how I maneuver it, it requires a great deal of radical honesty with myself, with my language uh, and with other poems. So those like I'd like to think it's it's helping me be a really true person. And I, I hope that I'm doing right by it. And I love hearing uh, my ulterior motives. I really just wanted to spend time with the baby. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's a that's a wonderful reason to do it. Yeah.